I, I'm sorry, this hat doesn't look good no matter how you wear it. <laughs> There's no good way to wear this hat. And, and I was saying to myself, I was, I was opening this, pretend to like it, and instead it came out of my mouth, what were you thinking? Were you drunk? I said, I'm not a dairy farmer from the inner lake. What am I going to do with this hat? I didn't want those words to come out of my mouth. It was profoundly ungrateful. But it's what came, what came out. Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. My message today is entitled, A Star Struck Christmas. And I, I know you're all familiar with that word, starstruck. And that is a word that has to do with people meet celebrities and they become sort of dumbfounded and starstruck. And, and when they meet them, they, they don't know what to say and they don't know how to act. And they react differently than they thought they were going to. And, uh, you know, I've actually been, I don't know if it's blessed or cursed, I have had many interactions with celebrities. It's been kind of a crazy life. I've met prime ministers, and I've met premiers, and I've met sports stars, and I've met, I've even met movie stars, Clint Eastwood for one of them. But generally, when I have my starstruck moments, they backfire on me. And I remember I was in Edmonton, I was doing an event, we were speaking to a crowd at the Jubilee Center in Edmonton, and Jerome Aginla, the hockey player, the Calgary Flames, he showed up and he came over and he shook my hand. I did not recognize him. And when he came over and he started shaking my hand, I'm shaking his hand like this, and a bunch of people started gathering around. They're all taking pictures, and I'm going, these people really like me. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, look at me go. And I, I was all like full of this moment, thinking they all want. So I'm smiling and shaking this guy's hand, whoever he is. Finally, I turned back to him and I said, so what did you say your name was? And he said, Jerome. And I said, well, nice to meet you, Jerome. Still didn't recognize him. His wife stand, standing right beside him and says, Jerome, as in Aginla, Jerome Aginla, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it dawned on me that this was all for him, not for me. And I was having this really weird, awkward moment. And you know what I felt like that, that day? You remember the story when Jesus comes in on Palm Sunday, and it's the triumphal entry, and everybody's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're laying down branches as he comes in on the donkey. You all remember that story? Imagine if the donkey thought that was all for him. <laughs> that, that's how I felt that particular day. And what we're going to discover today is that this idea of being starstruck is actually the appropriate response to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about, think about it, it's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of heaven and earth has come to earth and we of all people should be starstruck. So I'm going to pick up this story that, again, you know them all, so you'll know this one. It's Matthew chapter 2. It says, now... After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And you remember what happens next. He, they, they, they inquire of the scribes, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And the answer was Bethlehem. And then jumping down to verse 7, it says, Then Herod, uh, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And so, first of all, was that true? Was Herod going to go and find the child and, and worship him? 
Yeah, you see, I told you you knew the story. He was going to go kill him. Well, that was his plan. And in fact, when he found out that he didn't know where he was and didn't know who he was, he actually decreed that every male child under the age of two be slaughtered. I mean, talk about a genocidal absolute maniac. Talk about going to extreme lengths because he was intimidated by this baby who was born to be the king of the Jews. And he even, he, even he seemed to know that somehow. So we have this story about a star. And, you know, God could have very easily, what? He could have just very easily supernaturally made a star in the sky that only the wise men could see and they saw the star and nobody else saw the star. That was a possibility. But now with what we know about astronomy, we actually know there were celestial events at the time of Jesus' birth. In fact, for several years, from about 7 BC to about 4 BC, there was one celestial event actually uh, one in a lifetime kind of events in the Middle East. And the main, one of the main events was in uh, the, seven, the year 7 BC, and uh, it was called the Triple Conjunction. And I'm going to show you what it looks like, because we had one just not so long ago in uh, December of 2020 and into January. And what happens is this in one of these conjunctions is from Earth, what happens, and it's a very, very rare event, Jupiter and Saturn actually, they lined up in December, and by January, it was actually Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, and they all, not Mars, what was the other one? I can't see it there, something. Uh, the three of them lined up like this, and they, the, when the three planets line up together, it causes this, what appears to look like a brand new star that is exceedingly bright. And it would look something like this. This was a picture, this event that happened back then took uh, in, in Argentina. And the, this was a picture from there. That was the place where you could view it the most. And it's this extraordinary bright light. Now understand this about the wise men way back then. They were probably from Persia, the land of Persia. They wouldn't have known there was actually planets and stars. To them, everything out there was a star. You, you, you probably understand that. And when they saw this super bright star that looked brand new to them, they followed the star. And History now tells us, and they've recorded this because they can turn the clock back and they can tell exactly where the planets were way back when, that they know that this actual event happened in the constellation of Aries and could only be seen in the Middle East. And so this event actually has been uh, memorialized in a coin that was printed probably about 10 or 15 years later. And this is the coin. And if you see that ram, the ram is the symbol of, of Aries. And he, it was looking back to the star that not only did the wise men see this event, actually everybody would have seen this event. It would have been a very common thing. People were probably talking about this, this extraordinary thing. The difference was the wise men, because they were wise men, knew what it meant. And they knew that, that in their belief, a new star meant a new king was born. And the reason they knew it was the king of Israel was not because they, they saw it in, in the West, but because it was appeared in the constellation of Aries, which is the ram. And each one of the constellations in the ancient days was related to a particular people group. And the people group of Aries, are ready for this, was Israel. And so we have this little verse. I just want to give you a little history there. Uh, it's in Numbers chapter 24, and it says this. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. Jacob's another name for Israel. Thank you. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Twice in the book of Revelation, John refers to Jesus as the bright and morning star. Thank you. And so for whatever reason... God chose a star to be the symbol of the birth of the newborn king. He did this celestial event. And here's the thing that amazes me. Everybody would have seen it, but most of them actually ignored it. So I want to tell you a little story about my grandson, who's now four years old. And so he, this is his fourth Christmas, but now he's really getting into it. And the thing my grandson likes better than anything else is those presents under this tree. I would call it not a preoccupation. I would call it an obsession. And if you go over to his house, he will be able to pull every single present out from underneath the tree and tell you who it's from and to whom it's for. And he's got every single one of them categorized. He knows which is the biggest. He doesn't know what's in those boxes. He has manhandled those presents so much that my daughter has had to rewrap some of them twice. 
And if you go drop by, he'll be pulling the presence. And here's, here's my point about all of this. He is so preoccupied with the presence under the tree, he has missed the fact that there's a star on the top. And I'm using that as a bit of a metaphor for us because I think that's what we do. I think what we do is we get so caught up with the presence under the tree in life that we forget the star that's on top. And just for the record, my grandson does not get this thing about presence from me. I'm not the gift guy in our family. They don't even like to shop for me because they know I won't like it. And they say, oh, I drew dad. Oh, this is the worst. Uh, uh, a number of Christmases back, my daughter, and I said when I was, when I was opening the box, I was thinking to myself, pretend to like it, pretend to like it. She gave me this hat. Look at this hat. <laughs> this, this hat, I, I'm sorry, this hat doesn't look good no matter how you wear it. There's no good way to wear this hat. And, and I was saying to myself, I was, I was opening this, pretend to like it, and instead it came out of my mouth, what were you thinking? Were you drunk? <laughs> I said, I'm not a dairy farmer from the inner lake. What am I going to do with this hat? I didn't want those words to come out of my mouth. It was profoundly ungrateful. But it's what came, what came out. And uh, she's OK with this. We, we, we've, she's, she's gone to counseling, and she's doing OK. And, and anyway, so I, ha I had to put up the Christmas lights, and I put on the hat. And she was so excited this year because I was wearing She says, Pop, you're wearing the hat. I said, I love the hat. I use it when I fix the barn door, when I milk the cows. I'm using it all the time. <laughs> now, I'm being a little bit silly, but, I, but, but I'm trying to get across the fact that we get so caught up in these presents, we buy things with money we don't have for people we don't like, <laughs> the things that people don't even need. And that is not going to bring us what Christmas is meant to bring us. And what my challenge to you and to each one of us is the, the, the thing we need to look for at Christmas is to be starstruck. And I'm saying it figuratively to get our eyes off of what's under the tree and get our eyes on the star that's on top. That's what Christmas is all about. And see, the wise men, they were starstruck, weren't they? They were obsessed with that star. They followed that star, we think, for possibly two years till they finally got to this place. And then when they found it, it says here, when the stars stopped over where the child was born, it says they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I don't know too many people that are going and exhibiting exceeding great joy during Christmas, but that's what it's supposed to do. But we shouldn't be dumbfounded. We shouldn't be falling on the ground trembling. We shouldn't be in fear of him. We shouldn't become, you know, convoluted and, and discombobulated and awkward. What we need to understand is this simple thought that we rarely think about it at Christmas, that Jesus came as a human being. And what we get, which is so extraordinary, is a personal relationship with the living God, that should blow us away. We are encountering God in human flesh. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. That's what the incarnation is all about. The God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, actually comes to earth as a man, and we get to have this personal relationship with him. He's not some transcendent, distant God that you can't relate to, which in fact, most religions, that's what their God is. But this one is a personal God, and that's the kind of starstruck we want to have. And so I want to just give you three quick things today about what are, what are the Christmas gifts that, that we get when we're starstruck. And here's what they are. The gifts of a starstruck Christmas, their peace, their joy, and their hope. And we see these all, all the way through Scripture. So I want to begin with a story on this one about peace. Uh, in 1944... Uh, it was Christmas Eve in 1944, and it was behind enemy lines in Germany, and there was three American soldiers that had got separated from their platoon. And they ended up uh, lost. They were confused. They were hungry. They were tired. They didn't know what to do. They came across a farmhouse, and they decided they were going to take a chance, and they were going to go knock on the door. So they went and knocked on the door with their guns drawn, and a woman by the name of Elizabeth Vink, she came to the door, and only her and her 12-year-old son, Fritz, were living in this house. And they said, they held their guns up, and they said, we're hungry, we're tired, if you give us something to eat, we won't hurt you. She says, I will feed you, but it's Christmas Eve, you go put your guns in the barn, 
And when you put your guns in the barn, you can come into my house. So they went to the barn and put their guns in there, came back. She started to prepare a Christmas meal for them and gave them something to eat and give them something to drink. While that was happening, there was another knock on the door. And this time it was four German soldiers with their guns drawn. And she says to them, you may come in for Christmas dinner. She didn't tell them about the three Americans that were in there. You can come in for Christmas dinner, but you've got to put your guns in the barn. So they went out and put their guns in the barn and came in. And the next thing they know, they're sitting down for Christmas dinner with three American soldiers. And they broke bread and they had this meal. And uh, they sang Christmas carols together. And uh, then they all slept, spent the night in, in the house. And in the morning, on Christmas morning, they exchanged gifts out of, their, out of their bag. And one of the German soldiers gave one of the American men a compass because they were lost. They didn't know where they were. And, they, and he told them where their lines were so they could get back. And they followed the compass back to safety. Well, this young boy, young Fritz, watched this whole thing play out. This mother of incredible courage, uh, of incredible peace under a very stressful situation. And he just thought that was the amazing, most amazing thing he'd ever seen in his life. As he grew up, he actually immigrated to the US, and he decided that he was going to look for these three men and see if he could find these three men. He looked for 50 years, and, uh, or at least however many years he, he was, was in uh, North America. And he looked, and he could not find them. And someone heard about this story, and it went on that show. You've probably all seen it, Un Unsolved Mysteries. So the, they ran this, sh this story and, and, and told the whole thing all about young Fritz and his encounter with these, these three Americans and these four Germans. And there was a woman watching the show. It was 1995. She was watching the show, and she worked in an, an old folks' home, and she knew who that was. And she, he was one of the residents in her old folks' home, and his name was Ralph Blank. And so she phoned the show and says, I, I, think, I, know, I, know, I think I know that guy. He tells that story all the time. And so they contacted Fritz, and Fritz made the journey to Maryland where this man was. And the two of them sat down together. Here's the picture, just in case you think I'm making this all up. And that's Fritz on the right, and that's, that's Ralph Blank on the left. And these two, after 50 years, met together and reminisced about that moment. And then you know what Ralph did? He pulled out that compass that the German soldier had given him, and he said, I never let it out of my sight. Your mother's courage that night saved our life. It was the best Christmas I could ever have had. And the reason Fritz had spent so many years trying to find these men was he said it was the, the greatest moment of his life where his mother demonstrated this incredible courage but also an incredible peace under a very difficult situation. And I'm thinking, well, if they can find peace, if, that, if those people that I just described in that story could find peace at Christmas, why can't the rest of us? So I want you to think about this. It, did Jesus come to bring peace? Was it not announced peace on earth, goodwill towards, towards all men? That's what it was announced. And I look around me today, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but do you see people at peace today? I see people anxious, I see people unhappy, I see people uh, always worrying, I see the, and, and, and for good reason. I mean, the news bombards us with fear every moment of every day, and all we hear about is COVID and, and, and variants and hospitalization rates and this and that and inflation, and it goes on and on. Is there wonder anybody's at peace? And I think of all people, irrespective of what's going on in the world, of all people, shouldn't we as Christian people be at peace in the midst of this because we have been starstruck by the ruler of heaven. I mean, that's what this is all about. And I met last week with a pastor. We were sitting down and he was talking about all these restrictions and all these things that he had to go through and all these things he was dealing with in his church. And then he said this to me, I'm just so angry. To which I said to him, which one of the fruit of the spirit is anger again? Because I forget. <laughs> <laughs> and he just was dumbfounded, not starstruck. He was dumbfounded. But I was challenging him. I think if we as leaders can't find peace in the midst of this, as we as Christians can't find peace in the midst of this, what hope do the rest of the world have? So the first thing is peace. And when I look at these, these wise men, it's, it's interesting to me the, the kind of contrast between them and the rest of Jerusalem. There was two groups of people. Let me spell it out this way. There was two groups of people. There was the wise men and the shepherds, and what did they do? They went to the manger. 
And they went and worshipped the king. And they found joy and they found peace and they all found these. And then the other group of people was what our text described as Herod and all Jerusalem with him. And it specifically said they were what? Trouble. Trouble. Thank you. They were all troubled. They weren't at peace. And the big difference for us is that we are going to find peace when we find Christ. And those who find Christ, seek him and find him, find peace. Those who don't, those who are so busy looking under the tree instead of up at the star, those who are running out on Boxing Day because they didn't get what they had hoped to get on Christmas morning, so that's why they had these sales in the first place, those people are never going to find peace. So the first thing was peace. The second thing was, was joy. And I love this passage so much because it says when the, when the wise men got there, they, they bowed down and they worshiped him with exceedingly great joy. And I've told you this many times, but I think it bears repeating that there's a big difference between happiness and joy. There are extrinsic values and intrinsic values. And joy is more internal. Joy comes from within. And joy isn't about what happens on the outside, whereas happiness is an extrinsic value. It's something that has to do with the circumstances on the outside. And the problem with happiness is because it's related to circumstances, it's fleeting and it's ephemeral and it's there for a moment. And if something good happens, we're happy. And if something bad happens, we are sad. Whereas joy comes from within and joy can last even when something good isn't happening. And that's not to say that happiness is wrong. There's nothing wrong with happiness. Do you know that 30 times in Scripture the Bible talks, promises you happiness? It does. You, 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 go, you can look up these verses. They're fascinating. It says, happy is the man who finds wisdom. That would make him happy. Happy is the man who uh, eats the fruit of his labor. That makes you happy. It says, happy is the man whose quiver is full. You know what that means? Happy is the man who has children. Children make you happy, right? Like, like for a while. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, they make you happy for a little while. I, I, I'm going to tell you this story, and then I'm going to make a point about this. So when I was a kid, I remember my uncle showed up on Christmas Eve in his motorhome. His name was Cousin Eddie. <laughs> no, it wasn't Cousin Eddie, but it is true. He showed up on Christmas Eve in his motorhome. It was this big, beautiful motorhome. It's the most fantastic thing I'd ever seen. And I remember going through that thing, and I thought, wow, these guys just got it made. They have this fantastic motorhome. The next Christmas Eve, uh, Cousin Eddie shows up again. That's from Christmas Vacation, in case you're missing this. That, that was, that's, it's a butte, Clark. All right. And so, so anyway, the next Christmas, he shows up, and he doesn't have his motorhome. And I say, so Uncle Eddie, where's the motorhome? He says, Mark, let me tell you something. The two happiest days of my life were the day I bought it, and the day I sold it. <laughs> because external things can't make you happy long term, right? They only, ha they only have fast temporary relief. So when it says that, that happy is the man whose quiver is full, happy is the man who has kids, I can attest to that. The two happiest days of my life were the day our children came home from the hospital and the day they moved out. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not, not as big as a jerk as I play on TV. You know that, right? <laughs> so Jill Roberts was having a huff, hard time. She was a single mom. She was unemployed. Uh, she was having trouble feeding the kids. She had twin daughters, and they were having a really hard time. And the school knew that, that she was in, in a real pickle, and they put together this beautiful Christmas hamper. It was, you know, you know, this big ham and all these vegetables, and there was two Barbie dolls, one for each of her daughters on top of the parcel. The parcel arrived at the door, and she was, so, she was standing there crying because the school had provided this wonderful hamper for her. And she t managed to take the two dolls and put them in the, car, in, the, in the closet just before her two twin daughters had got home. So they didn't see them. But the daughters came, and they said, what's this? And so she explained to, their, to her daughters that, you know, that they were struggling, and the school knew that they needed something. And the two little girls wouldn't believe it and say, they must have made a mistake. We're not poor. This must be from the Juanita down the road. And they took the hamper, put it in their wagon, and walked down the road and gave it to Juanita, a new immigrant gal with her five kids. And then they came back empty-handed, and Jill couldn't believe it. She thought, my Christmas just went down the street in a wagon. 
And she was like sort of crestfallen by this, and she thought, I'm just going to make the best of it. And so then she made craft dinner for the kids and pulled out the, the two Barbie dolls, and that was their, their whole Christmas. And she said, though it was the leanest Christmas that she had ever had in her life, she said she had to, couldn't help but feeling that they had more joy because they had done something for another human being other than themselves. And Jesus said, it is more blessed to what? To give than to receive. And see, when you, when you receive, you're happy, but when you give, you have joy. And I always tell people this, and I think it's good advice. If you want to be happy for an hour, take, take a nap. If you want to be happy for a day, go fishing. You want to be happy for a week, go on a vacation. You want to be happy for a month, get married. If you, <laughs> if you, if you want to be happy for a year, win the lottery. But if you want joy that lasts forever, you know what you do? You start making other people happy in your life. And you start giving and serving and you start living for a cause greater than yourself. And when you begin to do that, you'll, you'll discover this great thing that the wise men discovered that day in the manger, an exceeding great joy. So first gift is peace. The second gift is joy. And the, and the last gift is hope. So this is a crazy story, so hang in there with me. So the year is 1972, and Don and his wife Nancy, he is an army chaplain. It's the Vietnam War, and he is stationed in Bangkok, where many of the soldiers come when they're, you know, not engaged in battle. And he's running this chaplain, or sorry, chaplaincy, this ch little chapel in the city of Bangkok. It's Christmas Eve, 1972, and she's homesick. Nancy can't believe she's separated from her family. There, she's in the Buddhist country. There's no Christmas. There's no decorations. There's no tree. There's no family. There's no parties. There's no nothing. She's just desperately homesick and desperately homesick for Christmas. And then her husband says to her, Dawn says, wakes her up almost in the middle of the night and says, we, 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 I got a big surprise. She says, it's the middle of the night, Christmas Eve. He says, I know, I got a big surprise for you. And so she gets dressed, and she says, where are we going? He says, we're going to the chapel. She says, it's the middle of the night. Why are we going to the chapel? They get to the chapel, and when they get to the chapel, the chapel is absolutely packed with servicemen. And when they get there, she looks in, and she sees these, these very pretty, lovely women that are clearly not part of that group. And then she sees, sitting down in the, in the, towards the side, none other than Bob Hope. And there's Bob Hope, there's, there, he's sitting there, and she, she's just drawn to him and sees Bob Hope. And he had been doing his Christmas tour, which he did, by the way, from 1964 all the way to 1972. And he heard this little chapel was in Bangkok, and before he flew out in the middle of the night, he visited this little chapel. They all gathered together in this place, and he told jokes, and he did a little routine, and he sang Christmas carols with them. And as she sat, sat there, uh, so despondent, about what her Christmas was looking like. She says, I got no family, I got no friends, I got no Christmas, I got no Christmas tree, I got no Christmas gifts. And then she said this, but at least I have hope. <laughs> I told you it was going somewhere to hang in there. And I thought, you know what, that's so, so absolutely the truth about this. It doesn't really matter what's going on around us. It doesn't matter. We have hope because our hope isn't in this world. Our hope is in the next and the fact that that baby in the manger was a symbol of something that was so extraordinary. See, the gospel of hope is so simple. See, Adam and Eve, in that garden, they fell. And when they fell, they actually put us in a very difficult predicament. And I know sometimes think people say, I should not be punished for what Adam and Eve do. Well, you're not punished for their sin. That's the good news. The bad news is you're punished for your own sin. And you got plenty of it. And you know how you got plenty of it? You inherited the sin nature of Adam and Eve. And God looked down from heaven onto that situation. And he realized man was in this predicament. There was no way he was going to get out of it. So he sent, as the scripture says, his right arm into the earth. He came and sent his son into the earth, born in that manger that day. A lowly manger, born in a stable. Didn't look like he was anything. But at the core, at the root, he was the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he went to the cross and when he went to the cross, everything changes for us because he was born to die. See, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. And the, the wages of sin is death. 
But here's the good news, the free gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus because that baby grew up, became a man, he died on the cross and he made him who knew no sin to be sin for you that you might be the righteousness of God in him and by that work of the cross we are made free and we have a hope the world could only desperately want and will never have without a relationship with the God who came to earth, Emmanuel. God with us. That's the message of a star-struck Christmas.